again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. It's really hard to believe we only have a few shows left this season. You still have time to get your questions in before that season is over, so give us a call at 1-800-676-5446 if you have a question tonight. If you've got pictures, you can send them to us, and that address is byf at UNL dot edu. Please tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can about your question. Do not forget to follow us during the week on those social media pages, YouTube and Facebook. So Kate, you have a beautiful little creature yes. in a box. In a box. It's staying in the box tonight. <laughs> so tonight I brought with me a wolf spider. So as we get into late summer and more into fall, spiders start to become more common. People run into them more both outdoors and indoors. Outdoors, we see all those beautiful orb weavers making their webs, and indoors, we often run into this little guy. This is a wolf spider. It is not a brown recluse spider. A lot of people get those confused. Um, but you'll see a lot of these start to come indoors in the fall, and you need to make sure to keep your porch lights off because that attracts insects, which is gonna attract spiders. And also fill in any gaps in the doors or any holes in screens because that's how these guys are getting inside. But wolf spiders like this are gonna be completely harmless. You know, they're not aggressive. Their bite, if it does happen, isn't of any medical importance. So if you do find one in your home, you can simply just relocate it outside. They're not my favorite spider because they can get really big. They can get really big. This is a small one, but they can get pretty large. Really big. <laughs> All right, yeah. thanks, Kate. All right, Rock, you do have turf for a turf guy, which sometimes doesn't happen in that chair. No, I, I don't have turf. I have an ornamental grass. Turfage. A sort of. turfage. You know, it's a member of the grass family. The reason I brought these in is that um, we really appreciate the images that everyone sends, but at the same time, there's a couple of key structures on a grass plant that is often missing, and sometimes I get lucky and sometimes I guess because we don't have the structures that I need. Now, the seed head, normally in a turf situation, you don't, you know, you're going to be mowing, and even in a, you know, in a, in a garden space, you may, may not have the seed head in, so let's just throw that away. We don't really need that. <laughs> but there's a structure, there's a region called the collar region, and that's right here on the grass plant. Um, and what you have here is multiple structures. You have the ligule, um, you have the oracle, and you have the collar. And if you look real closely, uh, this one was what we would call a pointed or toothed ligule. Um, and the oracle are absent on this particular plant. This is Carl Forster. And then you have the leaf. If you can get a close-up of that with your phone or with anything like that, this will go a long way because you actually have three different things here that are very unique in each grass plant. So one could have hairy ligules. We used to have a intramural um, volleyball team called the hairy ligules, for example. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> hey, that's a great name. <laughs> um, and then the leaves could be folded or rolled in the bud. It's a grass plant, but not that kind of grass, but it's still rolled in the bud. Um, but you got a lot of stuff going on here. So if you could just take the time to get a really good close-up of this region right here on the grass plant, that'll go a long way in us correctly identifying um, the grass that you send in or the picture that you, excuse me, the picture that you send. If you can just take, once again, a little close-up of that, you'll go a long way, and then you can help us help you. Perfect. It all just looks like grass to me. Like, that wouldn't help me. Like, what kind of grass is this? It's grass. It's grass. <laughs> it's exactly. green. It's grass. It's green. Mow it or eat it. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, John, what do you have tonight? <laughs> well, I have uh, some peppers that I harvested from my garden. So these are uh, some little peppers that we trialed a few years ago in the All-America Selections program. Uh, and it is an All-America Selections winner. Uh, so they're tiny little peppers. Uh, they look like they're very hot. And in normal cases, they would be. This is a habanero pepper. Uh, but this is a special kind of habanero pepper. It's a roulette habanero pepper, and it doesn't have any heat. It is a sweet habanero. And you ask, well, why would I want a sweet habanero? Because it's a hot pepper. Well, habaneros also have very, a very fruity floral flavor underneath all that heat. And you miss that, especially if you won't eat a hot pepper but you get that nice flavor. And so you can make something with these, like a pepper jelly or a jam, and you can add in like a little bit of jalapeno or another hot pepper to add the heat that you want so that you're not overwhelmed with the heat of the habanero. So this is roulette habanero, and you can just eat it just like a sweet pepper. We have these growing in our office this year, and people love them. And I love the name roulette because I, I was thinking, do you get a hot one on the plant and a sweet one? 
No, so far, no. <laughs> so far, right, no. so, so uh, <laughs> luckily, so, but here, if you want to have Watch. a snack, there we go. I brought one for everyone. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right, we're going to start with you. With That's Richard's. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're finished for tonight. We're just going to snack. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Kate, this, uh, this is an earlier picture, some of ours are, but this is a winter squash leaf from Omaha, and he wants to know what these eggs are in the back of the squash leaf. Yeah, so these look like stink bug eggs, possibly the brown marmorated stink bug. They are plant feeders, um, but if you come across the eggs on the plant, you can either squish them or just pull the leaf, and yeah. That's all they are, all right. Your next one is um, aphids on butterfly milkweed and on swamp milkweed here. Uh, this is also in Omaha. Massive aphid invasions, uh, worse on the tall ones, which again is this, the swamp. Not as bad on the orange one. She doesn't want to harm any potential butterflies. She wonders how, how does she control the aphids and then will the plants survive? Yeah, so these are oleander aphids, and oleander aphids love milkweed, and many, many milkweed plants often get just kind of overwhelmed with these aphids. The easiest thing to do that's not gonna harm any beneficial insects like butterflies are, is just going to you know, take the hose, spray it with a strong stream of water to knock those aphids down. But it's important to do that about weekly. Um, one and done just isn't gonna work with aphids because they reproduce really quickly. So just stay on top of it and get the hose out. All right, and, and the plants will be fine. Yes, the plants That's will be fine. Good. Your next picture is a Lincoln viewer found this on a bindweed-like vine. They, she thought it was a flower and then it wiggled. And uh, she realized that, you know, most flowers don't wiggle unless you wiggle them. So she doesn't necessarily want to get rid of it, but she wonders what the insects are on this vine. Yeah, so once again, these are aphids, likely the oleander aphid. I think the vine might be um, honey vine mm -hmm. milkweed. Mm -hmm. And so once again, lots and lots of aphids. Mm -hmm. All right, and finally, uh, this is a Southeast Lincoln viewer, lots of flowers, including milkweed that has these two on it. And they wanna know what both of these uh, insects are. So these are another couple of insects that specialize on milkweed too. That red one is called a red milkweed beetle. And then the caterpillars are milkweed tussock moths. So they'll eventually, they look like they're getting pretty large and ready to pupate. And so they'll turn into this moth, but, um, you know, they're not gonna kill the plant, they'll just feed off of it, cause a little bit of cosmetic damage, but the plants will be fine. All right, thank you, Kate. Okay, speaking of identifying grass, as rock. <laughs> Your first one, um, this viewer lives on a golf course in Bellevue. She's got this big area up against the cart path. She thinks it's crabgrass. She said she could pull it, but it would leave a big hole. Um, and it's sort of kind of a rough, so they're sort of managing this piece along the cart path a little differently. Yeah, I'm sure they're doing that for maintenance reasons. And first of all, snaps to Kate for the uh, nice ID on the honey vine well, milkweed, nicely done. Um, this is actually tall fescue, but not the tall fescue that you would put in your lawn. There are some forage types out there that are used for roughs on golf courses, and certainly if they're managing them less, they're probably gonna produce a seed head, and that's probably what came in here. There's nothing you can do here selectively to remove um, tall fescue in this particular instance, so she, she is gonna have, I believe it was, a, she, she is gonna have to dig that up and, um, and, and fill it in with some grass seed of her choosing, but, um, and, and you know, make sure you get it all, and it's gonna leave a pretty good chunk, so backfill with some garden soil and then, and then put some seed over it. And uh, right now is the ideal time to do that. All right, excellent. And NTEP would be the place to find the fescue. Yeah, the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, NTEP.org, is the most widespread uh, commodity, if you call turf a commodity, testing program in the nation. So thanks for that shout out for them. They do a great job. All right, thank you, Rock. Uh, your next one is a La Vista viewer, and she wonders, she, we have two pictures on this one, is this Bermuda or Zoysia, and is one preferable over the other? It was in her yard when she moved in. Okay, and, and the viewers, snaps to the viewers, because they sent a picture. On that first one, I would have had trouble, but when you look at the second one, clearly, uh, this is Zoysia grass, it has larger, 
um, when it's grown in the north, it has larger rhizomes. So you can see those rhizomes there. So thanks for digging that up and, and pu pulling it through. A and many people who know my feelings about zoysia, but if I had to choose between zoysia grass and Bermuda grass, I would choose zoysia grass so in this instance. If that's what she's got in her lawn, she'll just uh, um, need to learn how to manage it. And we have some information on our turf website for that. But um, if it's Bermuda grass, then the tendency for winter kill is very high. So in this case, um, be happy you've got zoysia grass and it should do fine under Nebraska conditions. All right, thank you, Rock. And then you have two pictures for this next one. Uh, she has a, this is La Vista. She has legacy buffalo grass. Um, it's 15 plus years old, but this year we've got this taking over. It's turned a bit shady and then this has come in and it's all through the yard. She, she's afraid she can't really do anything about this particular invader without harming the, the buffalo grass. Well, we have some good news for her, but let's start with the bad news. This is nimble will. Uh, which is a native, Muhlenberger is a, a, the genus name, um, and it's not uncommon in, in Bermuda grass lawn, excuse me, in buffalo grass lawns, especially when you consider the shade developed and nimble wool can grow in the heavy shade, it can grow in the in the full sun, et cetera. So, but the good news is uh, there's a product um, by the trade name Tenacity or Mesotrione, and Mesotrione is safe on buffalo grass, and two to three applications starting now um, we'll, we'll knock it back before the winter, and then when you see it again, remember it's a warm season grass, when you see it again in the spring, if it doesn't winter kill because you've knocked it back so hard with the mesotrione, then spray it a couple more times and generally three to five and over two seasons will give you about 85 to 100% control. So there is help, hope, and um, that's available in some of, not many of the garden stores, but co-ops have it, and as you, you can get it online as well, mesotrione. All right, thank you, Rock. All right, your first one, which is three pictures, John, is one that uh, all of us batted around. Mm -hmm. um, it is a tree, we'll start with that. This is an yes. aspen. Uh, it was planted four years ago after new construction. The side by the turf started dying about a month ago. Now it's spread to other branches. Some of the branches with dead leaves are still green underneath. Uh, the, the homeowner thought this was maybe herbicide drift because of an issue associated with the lawn company. But then, of course, with this, if not, what is it? And we saw everything from a little tiny bore hole in the trunk, Kate, to the leaves that no pathologist tonight, and drift, which is rocks, bailiwick, but it's a tree, so you get it, John. Uh, my luck, right? <laughs> uh, so for the first time this season, I'm gonna say it is not herbicide drift. Right. Uh, there's actually a whole lot of problems going on with this. Mm -hmm. So first off, those spots, probably what we would call Marcinina. It's a, a leaf spot, so aspen leaf spot on there. Uh, so that disease in and of itself will not kill the tree. If it keeps getting it over and over again, it will weaken the tree and it will eventually die out. But that's probably, at this point, the least of the problems with that tree. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we noticed a borer hole in there. I don't know if Kate has an opinion on that. <laughs> um, it's way down low, Kate, and it's a little hard to see there. Yeah, so, but we, we did notice that hole there. Um, but the big thing is that this tree is planted way too deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that we can tell that is that we should be able to see what we call the root flare at the base of all of those trunks which means that uh, that's where the, the roots connect and you can see that flare out uh, and we don't see that here. So that, that means this is planted too deeply and that creates an oxygen issue with the trunk and the air exchange. Uh, and so basically that's going to slowly kill the tree. Uh, and so really it's a short timer, I think. All right, thank you, John. And you have one more and this is a Valparaiso viewer who spotted this plant on an old building site and wondered if it was one that they could dig up and grow and would it be a great yard plant? <laughs> right, well, you can dig it up and grow it and it will grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so this cardinal vine, it's very lovely, beautiful red flower there. Uh, pollinators love it. Uh, unfortunately, um, in our area, it would be what we would call very aggressive. Uh, and as we get warmer, it becomes invasive. Mm -hmm. So in the south, it's very invasive. Uh, as our temperature sort of change around here, it's becoming more and more invasive in this area, so I wouldn't dig it up uh, and move it. Uh, and if it tells you anything in the south, 
what it's called, we call it devil shoestring. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to plant the devil shoestring in your garden, it'll take over. Well, and we do have one in the backyard farmer garden left over that we teach with and watch very carefully. So yeah, we, yeah, don't dig that one up. Yeah. Well, you know, you might have had a time where you stirred up a hornet's nest when you've been out in the lawn mowing or doing those other chores. They probably weren't hornets, they were more likely yellow jackets. So our NPM producer and director, Sean Carney, recently had a similar situation. Our very own Jody Green came to the rescue. Many people have experienced the pain of a wasp sting. Ouch! If you're one of those people who enjoys the outdoors, entertaining outside, and of course gardening in the late summer, it's good to be reminded that there are social wasps like yellow jackets that are present in the landscape. It's about this time that their nests can be home to hundreds of wasps that can be aggressive if you are anywhere near their nest and they feel like they are in danger. Yellow jackets are social wasps that often live underground in abandoned rodent burrows. They are often confused with ground nesting bees and sometimes cicada killers. Aside from being underground, they may also be found in buildings, in wall voids, any spaces that are available for them to form nests in in the early spring. If you see a hole with several flying insects coming and going repeatedly throughout the day, this is likely a yellow jacket nest. If you're not sure, it's best to take a short video from a safe distance and send that clip to your local extension office. Make note of the exact location and please avoid the area. If they are yellow jackets, you have three options. The first is that you can leave them alone and avoid that area until winter when the colony will eventually die off. The second option is contacting a professional pest control company that can get rid of the nest for you. And third, you can decide to treat yourself. If you choose the third option and want to treat yourself, remember safety first. This is a task you want to do at night when all the yellow jackets are in the nest and they are no longer active flying about. You want to make sure to wear proper protective gear. This can be as simple as long pants and long sleeves, but it's best to protect your head and neck and face. So if you have a bee hat or some kind of netting, that would be great, as well as some work gloves. Because it may be dark, you wanna use red lighting. You can easily put cellophane over a flashlight or use a red headlamp. Whatever insecticide you are using, make sure you read and follow the label. Then safely treat the nest and leave the area. The last thing you wanna do is come back the next day and check for activity. If there's still activity, repeat again that evening. Avoiding stings can be as simple as covering your food and beverages while eating outdoors, managing outdoor trash receptacles, and avoiding nests in the area. In times when yellow jacket nests are discovered in high traffic areas like front porches, eliminating them may be the best option. We do know that Sean did survive the multiple yellow jacket attacks, or we might not be on air tonight. But if you've got something similar happening around your home, do be careful, follow those guides to get rid of it. It's uh, nasty to get stung. All right, Kate, uh, your next uh, question and picture comes to us from Shenandoah, Iowa. And yes, they're slugs, and no, that's not an insect, but you usually get the... <laughs> The slugs, they were hanging from the side of the house by a string of slime, bluish goo. She wonders, are they mating or had they partied too much on a Saturday night? Well, that's a great question. And <laughs> yes, they, these are mating leopard slugs and that they actually need the slime to mate and they use gravity. And their, that blue slime that you see is actually their genitals. Um, so slugs are hermaphrodites and so they're mating. So in the not too distant future, you might see some baby slugs around those hostas that I spot right next to there. Or you squish them before. Or you squish them before, <laughs> before that happens. Before they happen. eat the hosta. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, that's a first, by the way. We've never had mating slugs on, on air. It's not something you see every day, for <laughs> sure. All right, your next one comes to us from Walt Hill. Uh, two pictures, um, nice pictures. This, they wonder what kind of caterpillar this is, found it while they were picking elderberries. So this is an Ackerman sphinx moth, so or a hornworm caterpillar, but it's going to turn into a sphinx moth. Beautiful one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your next picture is from Fremont. This one is also, what is this worm-like creature found in a Gerber daisy hanging basket? 
So this one I wasn't too sure about because of the angle of the picture. Um, just from where it was located and kind of the features that I was able to see, it could be um, a cutworm, possibly a budworm, and those are considered plant pests, but if you're not seeing too much damage on your daisies, you can kind of just let it go. Um, but yeah, it wasn't 100%, but I'm pretty sure it might be a cutworm. All right, pick it off and squish it. Yeah. And then a final one comes to us from Lake Park, Iowa. She thinks an insect has done this to her taters. And uh, since they've, they've already dug them this year, is there something they can do now so it doesn't happen again next year? Yeah, so this looks like it could be wireworm damage. We need to see the insect to be 100% sure, but wireworms are immature click beetles that live in the soil. Um, and they cause, you know, this is kind of what the typical damage looks like. Unfortunately, right now, there's not gonna be a whole lot you can do. Um, the best time to treat for wireworms is to sample pre-planting. And so take a sample of soil, see if you find any wireworms in it, and if that's the case, then you can do a, a broadcast spray. All right, thank you, Kate. Rock, now we have weeds and vines for your next round here. The first one uh, comes to us from Seward was in one of the flower beds, had to use leather gloves to get it out of there. Um, he wonders if it's horse nettle, what is this? It's not horse nettle, it's cat briar, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, Similax, I believe is a genus. Smilax. Simulax, I didn't say it right. I can read it, but I can't. Smilax. Smilax. Simulax. <laughs> Simulax, it's, <laughs> it's to make you regular or whatever it is. Anyway, besides <laughs> that, um, uh, these can be woody perennial, you know, they can be really invasive. They have huge rhizomes on them, but it looks like from what the viewer described, it should be relatively easy to get these out. I know, you know, wear leather gloves because you don't want them to prickle, prickle them. But if people see this in their yard now and they've got in a, it's been there multiple years, then you probably need to do a glyphosate treatment. And if you really don't want to be handling that, cut it off at the base and you could paint the glyphosate, um, the ready to use glyphosate right on that cut immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll actually translocate down and do a pretty good job. Um, but when they're young like this, it sounds like he said they'd never seen it before, right? right? So clearly it seems to me that they can probably get rid of this by pulling and or um, immediately seeing it and spraying it with glyphosate and keeping it off the, the desirable plants. But this is a nasty one and it can produce some pretty massive rhizomes and stick around for a while. Mm -hmm. It sure can. All right, your next one comes to us uh, from Lincoln. And she does know she has ole, oleander aphids on the vine. She wants to know what it is, but she mostly, Rock, you got this one because she said this is popping up all over the yard. She wants to know how to get rid of it. They don't have much for roots, but they keep coming back. Yeah, field bindweed, it's a perennial, long-lived perennial, and it looks weak, but it's not. Um, and it uh, primarily reproduces from seed. It's not really gonna spread, it's gonna die back to the ground. It kind of behaves like a herbaceous perennial, but um, not kinda, it does. But the bottom line is is that at the uh, Bill Gardens at Michigan State University, my alma mater, um, they have they bury seed and then they go back and grow them up and they have seed from a field bindweed that's been buried for 85 years and it still germinates. So this is a tenacious weed. It's a common problem in, in ag situations as well. Pulling is fruitless, just, you know, you really can't do it. So you can use the glove of death that we've described on, on the show for a number of years and put on a plastic glove, long, you know, like a Playtex living glove or whatever, and then a cotton glove and spray some ready to use um, glyphosate on it and then wipe it on the leaf. Don't pull on it, you don't want to pull it out of the ground and, and you'll have to be pretty, pretty persistent with that. So once again, that's a glyphosate uh, based product and be careful with the ones that you don't want to get it on. But generally when you wipe it on the leaf, it stays on there because they've got a surfactant and the ready to use formulation. Spray it on your cotton glove, make sure you wear that uh, plastic or rubber glove underneath it to keep it from getting it on your hands and fingers. Perfect, all right, uh, your next one is what is this vine and how do you kill it? Can I just repeat what I just yes. said? It's filled bindweed, so <laughs> same same drill, right? Yeah. Except these are now in intimate contact with desirable plants, right? So now you've got a problem with trying to get them out. So you can try to untwine them and pull them away from that plant, basically, and then apply the glyphosate and let them fall off to the side and not back on the desirable species. But those are back-to-back -back, uh, um, filled bindweeds. All right, and your final one here, she sent two pictures and she sent multiple ones earlier. Um, She's in Bellevue and has this, she's been dealing with this vine for five or six years and every single year it, gets, it seems like it gets more and more aggressive and grows in the heat. 
Um, what is this? Is this um, buckwheat or? I'm not sure what burr? this is. When I look at the first one, I thought it might be, you know, just a really robust Hedera or, or common ivy, but it's not, and I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't recall seeing the second picture, so that's on me, but um, I'm not sure. We'll have to get back to him on this one. Right, might be the wild buckwheat thing that's all over. I, I think you may be right, but I'm not confident. Yeah, if it flowers, we'll have her send another picture. Mm -hmm. I just, as it was going by, I'm like, I think you're right, Kim. I was, yeah, I didn't, from the first one, I wasn't confident that I knew what it was, and clearly it's not what I thought from that second picture. Okay. So winner, winner, you get a chicken dinner because you stumped the expert. <laughs> and they'll send us another picture. <laughs> and then they'll send us another picture. Good. <laughs> Perfect. All right, John, uh, you have, uh, what is this creature? The first one is bought cantaloupe seed, and this is what came up. This is a cassava melon, mm -hmm. uh, which is very fun. Uh, it's actually uh, the same species as cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, you know, so basically, you know, it could have been a mix up at the, the seed company. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, relatively new to the US. Like it's not a, a common thing that we grow here. It's originally from uh, sort of like the Middle Asian countries. Uh, and it came here from Turkey, from uh, cassava, Turkey. Nice. Uh, that's uh, why we named it the cassava. And it's got that, um, like, line, the lines on it. So you want to wash it well when you take it into harvest um, because it gets dirt in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a very thick rind compared to the others. So the, f the, f the flesh is on the inside. And it's not as sweet as other melons. So you can actually either eat it sweet or you can have savory. You can, like, put chili powder on it or, mm. like, mix it with, like, feta cheese or something like that. Um, and it's different than other melons. So if you've grown cantaloupes or watermelons, you know that the vine turns brown and the, the melon will slip off when it's ripe. Cassavas don't do that. So you basically just have to like watch yes. and guess <laughs> uh, because it won't do that like other melons do. All right, uh, and that was from Debuis, by the way. Your next one here is Glenwood, Iowa. Her pumpkins are rotting. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I think what's going on here, because it looks like the 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 rotting is on the the blossom end. I think this is actually blossom end rot. You know, we always talk about that in tomatoes, um, but it happens in squashes and pumpkins and peppers and all kinds of things as well. And what happens there is that there's a lack of calcium in the fruit in the plant. Doesn't mean that you have a lack of calcium in the soil. It's most commonly caused by uneven watering. So if you let the plant dry out too much. Uh, or if you um, overwater, then there can be an issue with that. All right, your next one you have two pictures of. This is a Fremont viewer, and this is also a mystery vine. She said it does taste like cucumber. What do you think it is? I think it's a type of cucumber. Great big uh, one. Just a great big cucumber. Mm -hmm. I was originally looking at the outside, I was originally thinking, could it have been cucumber crossed with watermelon? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just a, a, a weird cucumber. Okay, Enjoy. So maybe, and she said pre-hybrid stock or something. Yeah. And your final one here is an Auburn viewer. Cauliflower grew very tall, leaves curled in the center. Never happened before, what's the deal? I think it's just, um, you know, we plant, some people plant cauliflower in the spring and then in the summer it gets really hot and it doesn't really want to produce. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, ha this is what happens. It's just not produced. And as it gets really hot, the leaves start curling. And so I think, I don't think it's a disease or anything. I just think it was planted probably too late. All right, thank you, John. Well, we are proud to say we've donated quite a bit of produce from our garden to local food banks. We are still harvesting and probably will continue for some time now. Here's Terry with this week's update from the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are beginning to look at what we liked, what we didn't like, just like we've done in the past, what's really worked. We're also continuing harvesting our produce. The Backyard Farmer Garden has produced almost 400 pounds of produce out of it. And those of you that have donated for Grow Row have brought 90 pounds of produce. So we're looking at almost 500 pounds of produce that's been donated to local food banks and pantries in the East Campus area. Our seeds that we planted a few weeks ago for our fall garden are starting to look really good. They're getting some really good growth on them and we should be able to harvest them well into September and early October if our weather holds. 
Everything's looking really great now for the next few weeks, so stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden soon and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round and Rock, that was a loyal viewer and that was a zoysia grass lawn for your uh, edification that said BYF. <laughs> oh, was it really? Yeah. <laughs> they next, pick on me because I don't like zoysia. I don't, I'm feeling a... <laughs> next time they should like mow his name into it. There we go. <laughs> John, your first uh, lightning round question. This is a Hastings viewer wants to know when to dig their garlic. So you dig your garlic usually about midsummer, so it's actually a little late. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a viewer who wonders whether blossom end rot can occur on any side of a tomato, or is it always just on the bottom, and will it happen this late? Uh, it usually happens only on the bottom, but it could be sort of on the side, and it can happen any time that we have uneven watering. All right. Um, this is a DeWitt viewer who wants to know whether peas are a good fall crop for here, and if so, when to plant them. Uh, they're an okay fall crop. They're not the best, but you can give them a try. Probably a little late, though, for now. All right. Uh, we have a huge number of tomatoes on the vines in Columbus, but they are splitting on the vine. What's that all about? Probably uneven watering, probably too much water, rain, etc. All right. Um, this is a Grand Island viewer who had Swiss chard in containers held it over, still looks good, but it tastes awful. Why? Uh, because in the in the summer we get all the, the bitter compounds, it gets too big. All right, nice job. All right, Rock, are you ready? I don't know, five is hard to beat. Nice job, John. <laughs> Just take your time. <laughs> <laughs> Explain thoroughly. <laughs> all right, your first one, Rock. This is a Pierce viewer who wonders how to alleviate patches of crabgrass and windmill grass that are in his lawn in the future. So crabgrass is best controlled with a pre-emergent windmill grass. Um, you can use a, um, a product containing, um, come on Rock, Phylloxapure and uh, be aggressive when you put it down. And I'm sorry I, that's uh, the name, but you know, pay attention and write it out because it's hard to spell. All right. Uh, we have a Juniata viewer who says we talked about a taller, darker, thicker fescue on air. What would that be or where would we send her to find it other than watching our show online? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the thicker, bigger, more robust fescues are either K31, the variety K31 and that seed is still available um, and you can usually get it. It's not certified so you run the risk of picking up some orchard grass and some other things in there but it, it is um, available at most of your larger seed uh, dealers like United Seed in Omaha or, or Arrow Seed out west. All right, this is a Kansas City, Kansas viewer who wonders how to kill poison ivy around a fence. Um, generally anything, you know, there's poison we ivy directed killers that are available for most of your garden stores, but you 2,4-D by itself won't do well, but if you have 2,4-D plus glyphosate on a fence, that's usually a, a recipe for death in um, poison ivy. Just don't handle it Perfect. and don't burn it and stand downwind. All right, thank you so much. All right, Kate, are you ready? We have uh, an Elkhorn viewer who said red ants have created a colony in her garden and she wonders how to get rid of the red ant colony in the garden. Yeah, so with ants you can always use baits. Otherwise, if you know where they're coming from, kind of follow them back to where they are, to where their nest is, you can always spray an insecticide. All right, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who had leaf miner in her columbine. She wonders, will the leaf miners overwinter in the foliage or should, what should she do about that? I'm gonna pass on that one. All right, this is a West Point viewer who wants more good worms in his soil. He's wondering if he can buy fishing worms and then let them go to have more worms in the soil. So, depends on what kind of fishing worms you're looking at. Um, blood worms, definitely no, because they're aquatic. Um, if they're earthworms, you can certainly try. All right, this is a Beatrice viewer who wonders whether the ground nesting bees will nest in the same place every single year. Um, no, usually the colony will die out by the end of the year, so they might find some place new, but if the ground is suitable, they could stick around. All right, nice job all. John, you, you win the prize tonight. Excellent scores, you two, excellent scores. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, and our plants of the week were chosen for their go big redness since classes start. Right, classes start. Uh, so these big red fluffy guys here are amaranth burgundy. Uh, and amaranth, you grow it from seed uh, and it usually reseeds very easily on its own. I have a lot of amaranth in my garden. It just comes up everywhere. Um, huge showy, this one's a little floppy, uh, full sun annual. Fun fact, amaranth is in the same family as spinach. Uh, and uh, the seeds are edible, cooked like a grain, like quinoa, because they're related to quinoa. And actually the leaves mm -hmm. are also edible, like spinach. So mm -hmm. if you need a snack, mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, and then uh, this uh, taller white uh, plant here, uh, helichrysum, white wonder. Uh, it's pure white, lacy, lacy more upright, uh, excellent in uh, sunny containers. Uh, so that's a nice little sort of, I guess, crimson and cream collection there. We say, we say go big red, but it's really crimson as well. It's what really it's scarlet. To be. Scarlet, right. Scarlet and cream. All right, thank you, John. Kate, your first picture on this next round is from Lincoln. Uh, she says, what is this insect? The photos were taken early in the evening when it was visiting the flocks. Yeah, so this is another one of those sphinx moths. This one's called the snowberry clearwing sphinx. And it kind of has this really beautiful coloration that's meant to mimic like a honeybee or a bumblebee. It's really a beautiful moth. Mm -hmm. uh, your next one comes to us from Wahoo. What is this? So a very unoriginal name, it's called the great black wasp. It's a <laughs> large species of digger wasp that we have here in Nebraska. So they'll make their nests in the ground. Um, the adults feed on nectar and they're also predatory. That's what they feed their, their larvae. All right. And you you're, entomologist and your creative names. I yes. <laughs> <laughs> your next one is also a Lincoln viewer. Uh, he's wondering, is this, um, the result of ash borer, I assume he means ash emerald borer, part of a dead branch he found under the neighbor's ash tree. The tree still looks healthy. One across the street is partly brown and dying. Yeah, so this is definitely, or possibly from borers, but it's not from the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer has a really characteristic D-shaped hole. Um, these ones look more O-shaped or more round, and. There's many different types of borers that can get on ash. You have the redheaded, the banded, the lilac borer, so it could be any of those, but unfortunately it seems like that tree might be on its way out. All right, but it's not EAB. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, Rock, um, your first picture here is plant ID on this particular thing. It's pokeweed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, perennial, aggressively spreads by seeds. Um, they look showy, but they're medicinal as well as poisonous, and almost every part of it is poisonous. I, I'm not confident the roots are, but I know the leaves, the, um, the stems, and they can cause some people to have a hyperallergenic reaction when they rub up against them. So you don't want this, and you certainly don't want to let it get to this point in time, because where you have one, you will now have plenty more. So catch this as early as you can, and don't let it seed. Catch it before it pollinates, because it can be very aggressive and aggressively spread all over a yard or an acreage by seed. All right, uh, your next two pictures here come to us from Imperial. Uh, she said this popped up in the flower garden. Not much of a flower, the flowers are small. It's mostly all leaves. So what is this? Uh, this is um, beggar ticks or Spanish needle and um, it's an annual um, and it's really kind of quite difficult to control because the Spanish needle, it sticks to everything. So that seed is spread all over the place. So you wanna catch it be once again before, much like the poke bead before it seeds. And I would suggest you eradicate this because like the viewer said, it's not showy. It doesn't have a lot of look to it, but that's uh, beggar ticks or Spanish needles, people call them by both names. All right, and your final picture here is from Carney. This was a volunteer. What's this? Uh, it's either velvet leaf or also called known as buttonweed. Although where I'm from in the Southwest, button, buttonweed is a totally different species. So, you know, common names, but some people call it velvet leaf, which is a common agricultural pest. Um, and, um, but it's also known as buttonweed in, in the Midwest as, as well. And um, it's an annual, uh, relatively easy to control, uh, simply by snipping it off at the base and not letting it go to seed. All right, excellent, thank you very much. Okay, John, um, zucchini time. Yes. Your, your first picture comes to us from Albion. 
why is one of the zucchini producing these bumpy things and they haven't used any of them as the other plants are producing normally? Is this you or does this belong on the other end of the table? This actually belongs uh, in a chair that is not here tonight. Path. This is a pathology issue mm -hmm. uh, and I confirmed my suspicion with our resident pathologist, Kyle Broderick. Uh, this is zucchini yellow uh, mosaic spot. So uh, it's a viral disease, uh, can inf infect leaves and fruits. You get this kind of blistering on the fruits, so it's a yellow mosaic virus. Uh, and while they are ugly to look at, uh, they are edible. Uh, and viruses are more common than we think. If you ever see those warty pumpkins, mm -hmm. that's a viral disease as well. It's very similar. Like It's not the same disease, but uh, very similar. All right. Uh, your next two pictures are Let's see, Omaha, mm -hmm. not seen this before, no signs of end rot. The fruit looked fine on the outside. When he picked it up, it just totally collapsed. He dug through the mush, couldn't see any insects. They've got lots of healthy zucchini. They, they look for squash bug eggs. What do we think? Yeah, this one, because I had Kyle look at this one too, and we're not quite sure that there's a disease. We can't, we, there's no disease that has these symptoms in zucchini. Um, sometimes if we have a lot of excess water, the cucurbits will take up excess water. Like ex for example, um, cantaloupes, you can actually get water inside that then like ferments. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be that there was some overwatering and it took up too much water and got mushy. There could have been some damage to the fruit that then maybe like a opportunistic like rot got in there. Uh, but there's no pathogen that we know of that does this. Or maybe, you know, you got a lot of water, it got really hot and it cooked on the inside. It's sort of pre-cooked, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Not very good bread. No. Your next two pictures are an Oakland viewer. She put that one next to a basketball to show us how big it is. Um, first watermelon, it was tendril was half brown. There was a white spot. It weighed 23 pounds, but she split it open and this is what happened. So what does the vine need so it won't do this again? Right, so I think the clue was that the, the vine, the tendril attaching the melon was only half brown. I think it needed to be all the way brown. I don't think this is ripe yet. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the, the, the vine that attaches the melon to the plant will turn brown and the melon will come easily away. So it should actually come away with no vine left on it. It should basically be like the the melon's belly button, and that's what you come away with. All right, thanks, John. Well, you know, sometimes gardening is more than creating a beautiful landscape around your home or growing your own food. It can be a unifying activity that helps people connect with the community. UNL recently partnered with Community Crops to reach out to a group of refugees from Iraq, and it all happened around a garden. We're out here at Prairie Pines, and this is at 112th and Adams, so East Lincoln. And the area we're in right now is part of a partnership between Community Crops and Prairie Pines for our Yazidi Farmer uh, Training and Education Outreach Program. Community Crops is a nonprofit organization focused on sustainable um, community gardens, um, training gardeners, having kind of a sustainable gardening community within Lincoln so people can grow their own food. Um, things that are specific um, to specific cultural groups, um, as well as just having a supplemental fresh garden at hand. My name is Shah Bashar. Um, uh, I work with the Yazidi Cultural Center and Community Crabs. Uh, I came to United States in 2017, February 17. The partnership to found a, a Yazidi uh, a farmers. So Community Crab Locket for uh, farmers, they have the, a lot of experience in farming, they know, uh, they ask it and they know as it had a lot of experience. First year we started, 2019, we started uh, our produce. We are uh, kind of not teaching, kind of the introducing people to the, to our, uh, our cultural foods. We are doing a lot of conversation with people who are Yazidi, what they grew, where, where they grew foods, well, what is this? I mean, where, uh, I mean, eggplant, parsley, cutting celery, cress, what you are doing with it? How you cook it? What's your best recipe? I mean, people want to learn more. Yep. 
Now Lincoln's home to over 3,000 Yazidi members from Iraq. Uh, they're an ethnic and religious minority. And it's the largest population of Yazidis in the United States. And so this became a really great cultural exchange where Shahab was our cultural liaison, bridging the gap between many of our farmers who have nominal or no English um, with students who have no Kurdish Kurmanji. So now uh, the students have a deeper understanding of kind of cross-cultural communication, uh, local gardening practices and food ways, and also kind of understanding what it takes in part of the refugee process, as well as like the entrepreneurial spirit of these people. Being a refugee is not easy. So there's a lot of stress means to your home, back to your country, our, uh, you know, our family become a part. When I came to this land, I mean, pre I felt I belong to this land. So something is happening between ourselves and this, this land. With all my energy, I am working and encourage people to eat healthy, enjoy farming, and uh, we are growing for Nebraska and paying to Nebraska. So we are supporting Nebraska food, which is local food. What a great example of the power of gardening. We do hope to check in with this project again soon, and if you'd like to hear more about it, tune in to our Digging Deeper program that airs on our Facebook page right after the show. All right, we have kind of a quick round here. Kate, your first one is East Campus, a spider and its web. It wants to know more about the garden spider and the interesting zigzag in its web. So another original name, it's the yellow garden spider. <laughs> And that zipper you see is called a stabilimentum. And we don't really know its exact purpose. It could be to attract insects, maybe a billboard for birds not to fly into it. But we think it might just actually stabilize the web too. Very beautiful, that's Charlotte right there. All right, so uh, your next one here is a nest. It's been active for at least two months. At first it was a single wasp. He thought there'd be a birthing event and then they would leave. Instead, there are more and more. They wonder, uh, is there a queen in there and what should he do? Yes, yeah, so these are northern paper wasps and a birthing event did happen. That's why you're seeing more and more wasps. There is a queen there and the nest is going to continue to grow until they, um, it overwinters. So if it's in an area that you can leave it alone, you can, otherwise you'll need to, you know, go at night and use a wasp spray on the nest. All right, and your next two uh, pictures are from a Broken Bow viewer. They found this uh, beetle near West Point and, and they said it was trying to burrow into the ground. What is that? So this is a giant water bug. Um, and it was probably trying to burrow in the ground just to find some shelter, but they're normally associated with the water. And another name that they're called is called toe biters because they have this really sharp, you know, really sharp beak-like mouth part and their bite's quite painful. A toe biter. <laughs> That's kind of a fun name, actually. Mm -hmm. All right, Rock, uh, your first one comes to us from Lincoln. Uh, just Sunday, this picture came in. So this is pretty new here. This is in the Highlands in Northwest Lincoln, wondering what this five foot brown spot is in his lawn. So when we see pictures of this, our first instinct is say something laid on the turf and it was hot, right? And, and something burned it back a little bit and the good news is it'll recover. The other possibility is that we see we sometimes see this time of year uh, lawns go off color because they've got a contaminant that came in on the seed when it was planted. And, and so if they haven't seen this circle get bigger and bigger, then we probably don't think it's rough bluegrass or poa trivialis. So I think something was laying on the turf and um, check with your you know, children and then, you know, or, you know, we see this with slip and slides. We see this when people lay mats from their car when they're washing the car. And it doesn't take very long. Something can lay on the surface for as little as 20 minutes and cause this kind of discoloration. So either a close up and right on the edge of it would be helpful. Um, and But if it doesn't get any bigger and starts to recover, it was probably something unbeknownst to them that was laying on the tour for, for a short amount of time because nature is not symmetrical. Even circular patch diseases have some irregularity to them. So this is intriguing to me. I'd like to, I'd like the viewer to follow up and tell us what it looks like in, in a, another three to four weeks. All right, excellent. Uh, and your next one here is an Omaha viewer. 
and several spots in the lawn that have turned white and it's not powdery mildew the entire leaves are white so the the product um, tenacity or mesotrione does exactly this and this actually upon close inspection looks like crabgrass that has been sprayed so uh, i'm thinking that they sprayed or their lawn care company sprayed and and, and it's doing its job right it's discoloring um, and and damaging the chlorophyll which is what uh, um, mesotrione does so they're getting rid of the crabgrass which is a good thing um, and you notice that the other grass around it in and around it isn't isn't armed so that's my guess is that somebody unbeknownst to them or their lawn care company sprayed tenacity to control the crabgrass and it's working as it should I, I have no other explanation and this is just a very typical look mm -hmm. of um, tenacity damage or mesotrion damage on susceptible unwanted species so this is a good thing Exactly, all right. Uh, John, your first one here is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she wonders what's wrong with her rhododendron. Well, first off, uh, rhododendrons in our soil usually don't work very well. The pH is just wrong. Rhododendrons require a low pH soil. We have a high pH soil, so there's always gonna be issues. I think probably also some heat and water stress are going on with this one to, to cause that sudden, like the, the leaf flagging and the redness. Um, but you're always going to have disappointment with your rhododendrons. That one looks like a former rhododendron. Yeah, it looks like a, f uh, a former rhododendron. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, your next one is actually an azalea. Uh, mm -hmm. They think it's mandarin lights. She's got three of them. The edges of the leaves, you can see it a little bit on the bottom, are getting brown and they're curling. Uh, they were planted June 10th. Yeah, so that's probably a little late to get it established before summer because we need to get some roots going to take up water. So I'm, I'm guessing uh, that there's probably some water stress, heat stress going on with this plant for that leaf margin burning. This is also the same case. Uh, they require a low soil pH, so they're not going to be as happy and healthy uh, perhaps. Yeah. All right, uh, your next one comes to us from Midtown Omaha. Summer savory in a pot with tarragon and dill. He's had 10 years of growing these together and this is on the savory. What is this? Seeds? I think it's seeds. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a, like a seed, a fruiting body to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and your final one here is from Guide Rock. This is a peach tree that has um, these sorts of cracks all the way up the trunk. We don't have a picture of the full tree. Right. So this is the problem with peaches uh, here that they just don't thrive. I was just down at Kimmel Orchard uh, leading one of our, our path, plant path graduate classes through the orchard and talking diseases. And they showed us their peach orchard, all of them dead or almost dead. This is why we tell people in Nebraska don't plant peaches, they don't do this. So what happens is um, it's very cold in the winter, the sun hits that and it warms it up and it cracks and then diseases come in. So that's gonna be a former peach tree eventually.